All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Joey Martin. I'm a horticulturalist here in the gardens. I work mainly in the vegetable gardens. Uh, so big thanks for Paul to coming down here and showing us a little about vermiculture. I know I'm still in school. I'm at Forsyth Tech, still doing, trying to get my horticulture degree. Uh, but when I first started, vermiculture came up and I was very enthralled by the idea of worms uh, and it being beneficial to the soil and fertilizing and things like that. Uh, unfortunately, like vermiculture, like beekeeping, I want to get more into it. I just can't find the time, but I've uh, been talking to Paul and I'm definitely going to try and do some sort of uh, worm tea thing on my own and hopefully incorporate it into the gardens sooner rather than later. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to pass it on to Paul right now. And then you can put it on oh, I was the like, mic. Oh, got it. I was like, I don't know what this is. All right. Oh, probably for the Zoom people, right? Yes. Okay, got it. All right. Do it even? Did I get it? Probably stuck in my beard. All right. I think I got it. Good. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Paul. Um, I am a worm farmer. Um, big thanks to Joey and and Renolda for having me here. Um, I'm gonna apologize. I am going to talk super fast. I'm going to try not to talk super fast, but I could talk all day long about this and what my dad and I do. Um, and they only gave me an hour. So we will be, I will be here afterwards for questions. Oh, sorry. The camera. Yep. Good. How's it now? Better. Okay. Um, we'll be here after for a little while. If you have questions, ask questions at the end. I love questions. Um, but I'm going to try to get through this part of it. Um, Joey asked me to kind of give you guys an intro. This is worm farming as it is, is a crazy rabbit hole. Once you ask one question, that opens up to 10 more questions. And before you know it, we're three, four hours into this and you got to go and I got to go and my kid's getting off the bus and, you know, everything's going crazy. So um, we'll get rolling. You don't want to keep listening to me ramble about that. There we go. All right. So a little bit about our story. Um, we are a very small family owned business. Uh, hopefully to be bigger than a small, very small family-owned business. But right now we're very small. So you're going to see a lot of pictures throughout the presentation of me and my family um, because every just about everybody in our family is involved somehow. Um, that's my dad right there, passed out. There he is at the back. Um, he uh, did not approve this presentation ahead of time, so he didn't know this picture was going to be in there. But um, that's actually him in the middle awake um right there and those are my kids two of my kids we have three my wife and I have three kids under the age of seven and they're all with the exception of our one-year-old pretty active um our daughter loves the worms um but what happened was just to kind of give you a, a reader's digest condensed version COVID happened 2020 right come to the end of COVID December I'm working at a job in hospitality that I didn't really like I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with the rest of my life my parents are coming up on retirement. Um, my dad and I went to the grocery store. They were over for Christmas. And he said, out of nowhere, we're in the truck. There, no lead in, no anything. I have an idea. Perfect. What's your idea? Well, I want to start a business. Okay. Sounds awesome. I want to start a worm farm. Okay. Expand. And so he ex expounded a little, and um, and I, I'm pretty sure I remember, and he can you can ask him afterwards if I actually said this. I'm pretty sure I looked at him at some point during that, and I said, this is the dumbest idea I've ever heard of. This is not going to work. We're not going to make any money. This sounds ridiculous. Um, and he said, well, hear me out. Do some research, read, watch videos, figure it out. If you still think it's not a thing after that, then we won't do it. We'll do something else. But I'm the oldest of four kids. He wanted something that all of us plus the grandkids could do and we could build so that was something we could pass on to the grandkids when we were done. 
Um, so I went down the rabbit hole. I started doing research and I found first book I found was this. I brought these two. So if you guys want to get deeper into it, when can they see it on the zoom? Okay, cool. Um, this one is worms eat my garbage. This book is from the nineties. It's super old. Um, I'm not even sure that the lady who wrote it is still alive, but anybody who does anything with worm farming has read this book. I got it on Amazon. I think it was only 10 bucks. Um, but it's fantastic. It's a very, very good introduction kind of gives you the basics of what you can do at home. So first I read this book, this book led me to this lady, Dr. Rhonda Sherman. This is my Bible. This is our Bible. Okay. She is a professor at NC state and she's awesome. She is, she has been a vermiculturist, uh, for 28 years at NC state. She works in their solid waste, uh, division, if you will. She actually got hired to help them start their recycling program 28 years ago. And she had read that book and she said, you know what, we should really try to do something with worms here at NC state. And they laughed at her for years and years and years and years and years. And now she's the world, the worm lady. She's super famous. She was hired by the CEO of North face at one point to go to third world countries and help them develop their own vermicomposting operations. The, the CEO of Zappos, uh, it's a big online platform, hired her to do the exact same thing. Um, if you ask anyone in the world who is the global expert in vermiculture, it is Dr. Robin Sherman. And what's awesome about Dr. Rhonda Sherman is as famous and well-known as she is, she's still super down to earth. So if you left here today and you went and Googled Dr. Rhonda Sherman, NC State, her email address at NC State, because it's a, a land-grant university, will come up. And if you email her with a question about worms, she will email you back quickly. Um, and so I learned most everything that I have learned so far, which I'm going to show to you guys from her, and she helped me with the foundation. So um, the guy on the left is Greg Peterson. I'll talk to you a little bit about Greg as we go further into the presentation. Uh, do, 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 do. Am I moving? No. Oh, did it freeze? Now try it. Okay, cool. There we go. All right. So in a quick nutshell, Crash course. Vermiculture, vermicomposting, worming, worm farming, call it whatever you want. It's all the same thing. Okay. The, the, the vermicompost is just the process of using worms to compost. That's all. Um, the only difference you might get is some worm farmers call themselves worm farmers when really all they do is breed worms. And there is big money, big, big money in the breeding and the selling of worms and not just for fishing. It's really for, for the, for the composting. Yes, there's big money in, in breeding worms for fishing, but most of it is for composting. Um, those guys, they started selling their castings, maybe not. Um, but it, it's mostly for the breeding. Um, but don't overthink it. I am moderator of a lot of groups and a lot of message boards where there are people who are like, yeah, and, and Joey and I were talking about this before we started. They will spend hundreds of dollars, and I and I'm going to show you how to do this on on a shoestring budget. Don't don't leave here and spend a thousand dollars on stuff on the internet to start a worm farm. You're you're wasting your money. I guarantee you, if you pull seven or eight things from your garage, you can do it in in, in a week on on no money. Um, so it essentially is the process of using worms to co to convert organic waste into fertilizer. And then vermicompost, vermicompost first casting. So people will call it different things. Vermicompost is the unfinished product. So basically you take organic waste, food scraps, manure, um, leaf litter, any organic waste, and you feed it to the worms. As they start to break it down, that's vermicompost. As it starts to compost, that's vermicompost. Well, if you take that a step further, and I'll show you, I have some videos. That's my son. I don't know if you can kind of see it. What he has is a tub of castings. So if you take that vermicompost and you run it through a sifter, this is one of them, and I'll show you how this works. You can sift out the fine castings, the worm poop. Castings is just if somebody didn't want to say the word poop, which I don't understand because it's really fun to say the word poop, but they didn't want to say it. So they said, oh, I will just call it castings. So that's what worm castings is. It's essentially the finished part of the compost. All right, so what do you need to start your own, your own worm farm? Because that's what this is. This is an intro to worm farming. Well, you need worms, okay? Not all worms are created equal. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit before you guys got here. There are, some scientists say, between seven and 9,000 species of worms on the planet. 
all you're really, and they're not all composters. Um, we use a type of worm called red wigglers. Their, their scientific name, Isenia fetida. Don't confuse those red worms or red wigglers with red worms. Those red worms are not the same as red wigglers. Red worms, if you go to Walmart or anywhere that has a bait shop, and you open the little refrigerator where they keep the bait, you'll have a little cup of worms. It's probably just going to say red worms on the outside. If it doesn't say red wigglers, they're not red wigglers. They're probably European night crawlers or earthworms. Now, we'll also compost. They will, they will eat your organic waste, but they do it a lot slower than red wigglers. So if you're looking to do this to compost, to create good vermicompost, good worm castings, for your garden, for whatever you're doing it for, red wigglers is, is what you want. Feedstock, it's just a fancy term for food. So we'll go through all these as you get to it. You need a sifter, you need a worm blanket. I'll explain to you about worm blankets when we get a little bit further. You need some kind of bedding, and then you need somewhere there, somewhere there for them to live, their home or their container. All right, so start small. Okay, the KISS method, right? Keep it simple. So that on my finger, now that's my finger. That's a little baby worm. That's how tiny they are when they come out of the cocoon, okay? That's, that, those are red wigglers, but that's how tiny they are. So here's the easiest way to start small. I took, took pictures of this step-by-step -step that I did for you guys out at our farm. So let me see if I can get this thing to work. All right, so five-gallon bucket, okay? You can get a five-gallon bucket just anybody, anywhere. They're three bucks, four bucks. Get a drill with a spade bit, nothing bigger than a half an inch, okay? Drill holes all over the bucket. Just not the bottom and not in the lid. And make sure you have a lid. Dig a hole. There's your hole right there. Enough so that the bucket, when it's in the ground, the lid is flush with the ground. Okay, so you want the majority of this bucket in the ground. Fill it with kitchen scraps. Take your pick. Okay, whatever you got around. Coffee grounds. You got kids. My kids love oranges. My kids love bananas. Okay, banana peels, they go into compost. Orange peels, they go into compost. Summertime, coming, right? Watermelons, watermelon rinds go into compost, unless you're one of those people that likes to pickle watermelon rinds. Then they don't go into compost. Once you got vinegar in them, they, they either need to be rinsed or, or whatever because the worms don't like vinegar, but that's a whole other rabbit hole. We were at the farmer's market on Sunday. My three-year-old daughter was killing some strawberries. Strawberry tops go in the compost, okay? Fill your bucket. Top is as much as you want. Whoop, I didn't mean to do that. There we go. So put your lid on. After about two weeks, you're going to pull that lid, and your bucket's going to be full of worms. They are in your yard. Okay, you, Just because you don't see them doesn't mean they're not there. Now, the healthier the soil, the more worms per square inch or per square foot or per square yard. <clears throat> so it might take a little bit longer, but they will find the food through the holes in that bucket and they will come into that bucket and they will devour your organic waste and then they will leave you castings. Now, what do you do with it? Okay, so there's your worms. What do you use? What do we talk about? Red wigglers, Isenia fetida, okay? These are our guys. Now, <clears throat> there, there are also other composters. You don't have to use red wigglers. If you're looking to get good quality castings and get them moderately fast, Red wigglers is what you're what you're looking for. Earthworms will compost. They just do it a lot slower. We've done tests before where we had a bin of red wigglers and a bin of earthworms. We fed them the exact same thing at the exact same time, and it takes the earthworms almost double the amount of time to break down the exact same organic waste as it does the red wigglers. So there's a myth floating around that red wigglers consume their body weight in food every 24 hours not really true um you know i'm not sure there's been a ton of science to prove or disprove that but you know that's if you think about it that's a lot of a lot of food for especially for a worm in 24 hours they do it fairly quickly but i'm not sure it's really every every 24 hours pot worms so if you're doing this right you are going to get all kinds of insects in your worm bin in your bucket like i showed you not just red wigglers not just red worms if you ever see little tiny white worms, people are worried that they're like snake babies or, or something that's not supposed to be in there. They're not. They're called pot worms. And they're completely safe. They are composters. Like I was explaining to somebody before we started, though, be careful with volunteers coming in 
to your, your bin because while they may not consume the worms, they will consume the food that you want the worms to be consuming. And the pot worms aren't leaving you the same thing that the red wigglers are. So I had somebody ask me, I was teaching a class, somebody asked me the other day, black soldier fly larva. Okay. Everybody loves black soldier fly larva, especially if you have chickens. Chickens love black soldier fly larva. They are notoriously fantastic composters. And there's a good chance you've seen them and didn't even know what they are. They look, they actually look like little tanks. Um, they kind of look like the roly polies, but longer. But they're really, really good composters. And somebody asked me the other day, they said, Hey, do black soldier fly larvae eat worms? And I said, No, they're not, they're not meat eaters. They are they're composters. They like dead decaying material. Oh, well, I had a bin and I had black soldier fly larvae and worms in the same bin and all of my worms died and the black soldier fly larvae are thriving well what probably happened was the black soldier fly larvae consumed all the food and the worms starved to death so do your best to keep them separate while they're just as good in the small contained area they haven't figured out how to coexist um so that's your black soldier fly larvae and your pot worms all right so where do you get worms from well i blacked out the label right here. We've probably in the last uh, two-ish years bought worms from everywhere um, to try to see who had the best ones, um, who did the best shipping. Um, and I encourage you to find someplace local. Um, if you want one, we're offline. I can give you uh, a couple of recommendations of the ones that we have used and we have liked um, shipping wise. But if you can find somebody local where you don't have to ship, um, worms don't like to ship, especially in the summertime, gets too hot. So one of the vendors that we purchased worms from um, shipped USPS. And you see, see that? Those are worms underneath the packing tape that tried to escape the box because it was too hot in the mail truck. You see them in the little, that they're all over the bin. And the when I opened it, opened the box when I finally got to it because I couldn't figure out why they weren't getting delivered. They just kept leaving a piece of paper in my mailbox. The post office kept saying, okay, come to the post office. And thankfully it's fairly close to my house. Well, I went and I handed the lady the paper and she looked at me right in the face. She goes, you're the one who ordered the worms. And I'm like, yes, why? And she's like, because they're all over the back room. And sure enough, they were all in this, you've seen the USPS tubs where they, you know, carry mail or whatever. They were all in this tub. And so I, I got the box. I'm standing in the post office. I scooped the worms out. I cut the box open. I put the worms back in. She goes, and I gave her the tub back. And she goes, no, 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 just take it. And I'm like, okay. So I took it. It's up at our farm now. I, I, I use it to carry stuff around, but uh, she didn't want it. But so that's why I try to encourage people to either purchase worms local, get them out of your yard via the bucket that I showed you, or, um, Find a company that ships either overnight or two day. Two day is usually the sweet spot, even if it's hot outside. And there are, depending on your vendor, they pack the worms appropriately. You might get an ice pack in there. You might get a little bit of food for their for their trip, for their travel. Um, because the, you know, if they're too warm or they're too cold or there's no food and they're starving, they're gonna try to escape. And that's what happens. So and it, and it happened to us. Um, this is Anybody know what that used to be? Anybody? Anybody? Close. Anybody else? That's a good guess. Though. Used to be an apple. So worms like anything organic, dead, dying, anything. Used to be an apple. Um, I'll show you when we start, when we talk about feedstock, there are th certain things that worm like, worms like more than others, but they, they really, really like dead and decaying apples. All right, bedding. So you build a worm bin, right? Those totes right there make perfect worm bins. Again, the gray ones right here next to Joey. I forgot. I was going to bring you guys one. It's sitting in my garage. I completely forgot, and I apologize. We use, when we first started, we used the big commander totes with the yellow tops. You can get them at Costco for seven, eight bucks. Drill holes around the rim. First thing that goes in your bin, bedding. Again, I told you this at the beginning. Don't overthink it. People love to spend money on stuff they don't need. You want to do that? It's your money. Do your thing. If you have leaves in your yard, leaves and leaf litter make perfect bedding. They're probably the best bedding that you can ever get, and you don't have to pay for it. Um, and if you want to take it a step further, I actually went on Amazon. They, they sell a leaf shredder. The company, I think, is Sunjo. 
and you can drop leaves down into the top and it shreds the leaves down on the bottom and you collect them in a bin. And then the worms even like that a little bit better. They're not expensive. Um, it really runs on the concept of a, of a weed whacker. It actually has a weed whacker head in the middle that spins. You plug it in, it's electric. You dump your leaves in and it shreds the, the leaves for the worms. You're basically just helping them. But leaves, that's why I have it first because that's what we use. I don't use anything else. Shredded paper. People love shredded paper. Problem with shredded paper is not all shredded paper is created equally. Okay. So the majority of shredded paper or shredded newspaper, if you will, newspaper now, almost all inks that if there are any print newspapers that are still not, that aren't online, I don't even know if, if, if real newspapers exist anymore. Um, but if they do, uh, all that or the ink they use is organic. Most of them are using soy ink. And a lot of the newspapers are printed on recycled paper. So you're, you're, you're don't have to worry about chemicals. People always worry about chemicals with shredded newspaper. The problem is with shredded newspaper, what happens to shredded paper when it gets wet? Anybody make paper mache stuff when they were in school, right? It turns into cement and that there is a bit of moisture in every worm bin. So if you have it in the worm bin and you use that as bedding, chances are, it's going to turn into cement before the worms have an opportunity to, to consume it, and then they can't move in and out of it. So you can use shredded paper. The problem with shredded paper is moisture. It's going to absorb the moisture, and before you know it, you got you have a just a disgusting mess. And then you end up having to take it all out and starting all over again. The other thing with shredded paper is you can't use the glossy stuff. So magazines will not work. Um, they will not break it down. The worms will just go right on past it because of, of whatever coating the magazine companies use to make their pages glossy. You, you just can't use it. People love, love, love cocoa. And, and there are the best part about this is there are debates, actual debates on how you say this. Do you say cocoa core? Do you say cocoa core? What, how, how is it pronounced? I just say cocoa core. I say, don't use it. You can use it if you, you can use it if you want, but I don't use it. We have never spent any money on it. The only way to get it, number one, is to buy it. So this is what I always talk about with people is anything that is a product, okay, almost always has a byproduct, right? And we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get further through to what worms eat and what worms don't eat. Well, if you're a good business person, sure, you figure out how to monetize that byproduct because you have so much of it. You know, use a, a sawmill for an example, right? People have sawmills, you, you run your wood through the sawmill, What's a byproduct of, of making lumber? Sawdust, right? You have piles and piles of sawdust. Well, what am I going to do with sawdust? I'm just not going to just shovel it in a pile. How do I make money off of it? Well, somebody said mix it with glue, put it in a machine. So then we have press board, right? Anybody buy Ikea for you buy Ikea furniture? Ikea furniture is made from press board. That's sawdust mixed with glue put through a machine. So they figured out how to monetize the sawdust. Excuse me. So if you buy coconut, coconut flakes, coconut water, coconut whatever, well, what's the part of the coconut that you can't eat? You can't eat the outside, right? That's coconut core. That's coconut coir. That's that's what that is, okay? It's the fine threads on the outside of a coconut. Well, worms love it. They'll eat it. It makes really, really good bedding. And it's really, really expensive. Spend your money on it if you want. You don't need it, okay? Leaves. That's why it's listed number one right there. It's the best bedding there is. All right, feedstock. Again, fancy for just just for food. So I brought you guys a present. Um, sorry, Zoom people. I'm going to step off the camera for just a second. This is a refrigerator magnet. It's the exact same thing as what's up there on the right. I brought one for everybody. And I'm sorry if it's small. It's the only way I could fit it on a magnet. You could, okay. Um, <clears throat> it is here. There you go. Thank you. It is kind of a one-stop shop on what red wigglers eat and what you shouldn't feed them. The only thing that I sort of disagree with on this one is where it says do not feed the top part citrus fruits. Citrus fruits are okay, and I'm going to tell you why. So the reason they say don't use citrus fruits is worms don't like highly acidic environments. Okay, But what we're doing here is you're not taking <clears throat> orange rinds that you literally just ate the orange and the orange rinds goes right into the worm bin. You want the moldy, the stinky stuff, okay? So that fungus, when you see mold, when you see fungus on the outside, that fungus is actually starting to break down the rind or the citrus fruit as it started to spoil. And the acidity over time will go down. Worms don't mind the acidity. Now, 
what's what's that you always said my mother always said it too too much of anything is bad right don't fill your entire worm bin full of ex, you know expired oranges you can go to harris teeter you know they have the ex, the expiring fruit rack you get the bundles for a dollar don't buy a three pound bag of expired oranges and dump those oranges into your bin you're going to kill all your worms they don't mind the acidity but too much will harm them so where it just says to me, do not feed is too blanket of a statement. You can feed it just in moderation. The other thing that I don't 100% agree with is meats and bones. Yes, meats are not good for worms, of course. Bones are not horrible. I have tinkered with old chicken bones before. While they break down a lot slower, the worms actually prefer the marrow inside the bones. And then over time, once the marrow, once they've consumed the marrow, the bone it's uh, the bones themselves are brittle enough that you can take a hammer and shatter them and then they're a good source of calcium for the worms also they use them as grit they take a lot longer to break down but bones are typically okay the reason they put meats and bones sometimes too is because you have to be careful with composting of meats and bones because you're inviting varmints rats raccoons possums um, stuff you don't want stuff that will actually eat your worms um and you, you're just you just don't want them they're they're the undesirables so this right here any guesses anybody close super close even closer cantaloupe rind okay so there's your cantaloupe on the top and there's your rind actually this little white guy right can anybody see that that is a black soldier fly larva i just noticed it see how it kind of looks like a little tank um, but they're coexisting with the red wigglers. You just have to make sure there's not too many. Um, but cantaloupe rind, they love, 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 love melon of any kind. Cantaloupe, honeydew, watermelon. Okay. Summertime, that's the best thing for them. All right. Moving on to the next one. Okay. Container, where do they live? So we talked about spending money on stuff you don't need. Okay. Anybody ever seen that before? It's a worm tower, okay? It's, it's literally what they call it, a worm tower. Basically what it is, anybody who's handy, you can build one, super easy. Four pieces of wood, hardware cloth, build six of them, stack them on top of each other, <clears throat> feed in a tray, the worms will travel to where the food is, leave the castings behind. Feed in the next tray, they'll leave the castings behind, wash, rinse, repeat. <clears throat> Any idea, if you bought this online, then that tray is usually where the castings fall down into. And then what you're not seeing here is uh, on the far side is like a, like a faucet, like a tap, um, because most organic material is 80 to 85% liquid, right? Well, as that organic material breaks down, that liquid needs someplace to go. Well, it's going to collect there, and it's called leachate. Uh, it's not not great for your plants. So you really just want to drain it. So that's what that drain is typically for. Anybody, any ideas how much that goes for? Cheapest ones are $150. $150. I could build it for 20 bucks. Okay. Think about that. So that's why it has a big red X. Spend your money on it. Don't spend your money on it, but you don't need it. Okay. We started small. Okay. This is what we did. So here are my totes I told you about. Okay. We started with two in our, my, my wife and I in our downstairs bedroom. Once we outgrew the two, they moved to our garage. We got to about 20 or so before that was it. And then we had to expand even further. So my dad bought a farm and this is our worm trough. I built it. Basically, it's, it's in our barn. You have four uprights. They're holding the hayloft up. And I put two by sixes across the bottom, screwed to some two by fours. I lined it with a tarp and then all our worms live in here. So the difference is when you're in a tote, unless you're in business, like we're in business, we're, we do, we have customers that buy our castings. They, they expect a certain amount of product from us every single week. Um, so we need to do it on a larger scale. Most of you guys are probably home gardeners. You don't need more than one or two totes. You really just need one. Um, spend the seven, eight bucks at Costco. To be honest with you, most of you probably have one in your attic that has clothes in it that could go to Goodwill and then you have a free one. Drill holes around the edge, around the top, uh, like right below the lip right here. Air holes keep the airflow through. You're gonna wanna put your lid on, okay? 
if you want more than one bin, don't be like me and drill holes in the lid. Because what happens when you have more than one bin and you need to stack them, now you're blocking the holes that you just drilled in the lid. So learn from my mistakes. Drill around the top of the bin, not on the lid. I have a few bins at our, at our barn, in our barn, because we don't use the bins anymore, that have holes in the lid. And every time I see them, I'm like, eh, you shouldn't have done that. But, you know, you live and you learn. So now we're in this trough, and we bait feed. So worms don't like to be bothered. There are people, and I told you I'm in message boards and in groups. I'm a moderator. Worms don't like to be bothered. Don't be those people that feel the need to check on your worms every day. Okay? They exist. You laugh. They exist. Some multiple times a day. Don't dig your hands in there and then wonder after a month of you playing with them why they haven't given you any castings. <clears throat> Believe it or not, worms have feelings. Okay? They really do. And they don't like to be disturbed. And the happier they are, the more they're going to produce for you. The more they're going to reproduce and give you more worms. And the more they're going to eat and give you more castings. So the more you leave them be to their own devices, the better off you're going to be, the better off they're going to be. So until we knew what we didn't know or didn't know what we didn't know, we were in totes. And every time the population in one tote got too much for the bin, I split the population and I made another bin. That's how we went from two to 20. Um, but every time I needed to harvest castings, I was disturbing the worms because I had to remove the contents of every bin. And basically you're putting them through trauma because they think every single time they see light, every single time they see something moving, they think they're about to get eaten. That's all they think because they're, they're very, very small organisms. They spend their time outside running from birds and, and other small uh, uh, creatures. So try not to disturb them. So what we've done now is they're in a trough. And so we bait feed them. So on one side, like, and I do it once a week, I'll go in and on, let's say on the left side, it's left side week. I will dig a little hole and I will feed. I'll put whatever I'm feeding right now. It's frozen pumpkin. Cause I've still got pumpkin left over from Halloween. Frozen pumpkin goes in the hole. And over the course of that week, all of the worms in this trough, this trough's about 12 feet long. <clears throat> will gravitate to where that pumpkin is. And they will leave castings and everything else everywhere else. And so I will go to where they're not and harvest the castings from that area so that I'm not disturbing the worms. They've left their castings behind and they're eating and I don't mess with them. And then the next week is right side week. I will feed them on the right side and they will vacate. And then I'll take the castings from the left side so that I don't disturb them. They produce faster, they reproduce faster, they do everything I want them to do faster, and they don't have the shock of being messed with every single week. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. All right, so there's home. All right, blankets. Ah, Joey and I were talking about this before you guys got here. So every worm bin, and even a trough, needs a worm blanket. Do not, well, do what you want, it's your money. But don't buy a worm blanket. There are companies, go home, Google it if you don't believe me, that sell worm blankets. They're about 15 bucks. They are a complete and utter waste of money, okay? In two years in business, my dad and I have never purchased one worm blanket, okay? So what do these look like? What does that look like? Anybody? Can you see what that says on that? Anybody? It says Levi Strauss. Jeans, they're blue jeans. Okay, and it's hard to see, but there's worms all in there. That is a t-shirt. This used to be, I have a six-year-old son who used to go for preschool. He's public school now, kindergarten. But for preschool, he used to have to wear uniforms, little polo shirts. They're super cute. But he didn't need them when he went to public school because they don't require uniforms. So what do you do with them? Well, could donate them. But you know what happens when you donate clothes that don't get sold? They get thrown in the trash. So they're going in the trash anyway. Okay? So why not make something, use it, we're using it for a worm blanket, and then the worms eat it, right? This, right here, used to be an extra large t-shirt. And if you don't believe me, because pictures are crazy, in this bucket, can the zoomer see it? 
Okay. In this bucket used to be seven extra large t-shirts. Okay. If I had separate seven extra large t-shirts, they would not fit in this little tub. Go ahead. Do you have to be careful? Um, should it be like a hundred percent cotton? That's a fantastic question. So for those who on Zoom who may not have heard it, what about the fabric? Do you have to be careful that it's not 100% cotton? The answer to that is no. So this is going to blow your mind because to this day, I've been doing this for a while now, it still blows my mind. They know, okay, worms, these tiny bitty creatures with no eyes, no nose, just a mouth and a backside, they know what's food and what's not food. Most of my, now, it's and it's hard to get nowadays 100% cotton anything, right? Some rayon and stuff, polyester, whatever. Most of these are 99.1 or 95.5. And the five in most of these are polyester. And the polyester is the stitching and the tag. They consume all of the cotton. And don't ask me how they know food, right? what, what the food is. I'm not a biologist. I'm not an entomologist. I have a bachelor's degree in English for crying out loud. But this is what they've left me. I've And I've tried, believe me, my dad will tell you. I've tried to get them to eat this because I was like, oh, we can be millionaires. I get them to, if I could figure out how to get the worms to break down the synthetic fibers, right? But they won't do it. They literally just push it around. They will push it around the bin. They'll push it around the trough and they will leave it to the side. And I'm sure at some point they're saying, hey man, get this out of here. We're not going to eat it no matter how long you leave it in here. Give us the cotton. We want the cotton. And so this is what I tell you about with byproducts, right? Polyester, synthetic fibers, okay? It's a petroleum byproduct. So, you know, you have fossil fuels, you know, make gasoline, you refine it. There's a byproduct. Well, there were drums and drums and drums of petroleum byproduct from refining fossil fuels. How do we make money in this? It's just taking up all the space. One of the things they did, synthetic fibers. You had a question. You do. So let me see. I'm um, going back, going back, going back. Because I saw somebody made a face when I had the. There it is. Whoop. So that used to be a dish towel. Dish towel. Okay. That one, I think it was 95.5, 95% cotton. My wife and I were changing out dish towels. I'm like, I'm not throwing this thing in the trash. They eventually ate it all and left me the, the stitching on the outside and then the tag from wherever wherever it was. But so, yes, you put it on top. And the purpose of the blanket, I, I guess I probably could have led with why do you need a blanket? Um, the purpose is multifold, right? So worms like it dark, okay? So you're making it even darker. Yes, you're using a tote with a lid. There is a darkness factor there. The blanket is making it even darker. So what you want is you want the worms down inside whatever you have in there, in your bedding, in your food, eating, reproducing. You don't want them climbing the walls, trying to figure out how to escape because they're they're going to. They don't want to be in there. Um, make it nice for them. Make it cozy for them. The happier they are, the more they're going to want to stay in there. If you go and take your lid off one day and the entire rim is covered in worms, something is not right. It's too wet. They didn't like the food. Some, something, there's no, there's no stasis there. Um, so that's to make it darker. It's also to keep the moisture in because you don't want the bedding to be too dry. And you don't want it to be too wet. Okay. So we talked about bedding. We talked about container. So your bedding's in, your worms are in blanket. Okay. Sifter. Here we go. It's the fun part. So people always ask me, this is awesome. I have my worm bin. The food, the worms have eaten all of my food and it's full of all this stuff. How do I get the good stuff? How do I get the black gold? Okay, how do I get it separated from the pieces of eggshell that they haven't digested yet? How do they get it out of there? Well, you got to sift it. So from humble beginnings, right, I wanted to make sure you guys saw you can start from nothing and expand depending on what you want. So this is where we started right here. Okay, and it's kind of this one's a little hard to see. This is a frame I built from old bed slats. Okay, I don't, you can ask my wife, I feel bad for her every day because I don't really throw anything in the garbage. Everything gets shoved in the garage until I can figure out how to repurpose it into something. And we throw some stuff away, but very little. So old bed slats that were broken, I, I turned into a frame. I literally just built a box, screwed them together. <clears throat> Wrapped around it and then stapled 
is a mesh uh, synthetic fabric. I had my wife and I had been had gone to Lowe's. We were building uh, tree rings from stone. This is our actually there's the tree rings right there. This is our house in Harrisburg. So that's our tree ring. We had gone to buy a paved stone from Lowe's, and in between the layers of the stone, they put this mesh so that the stones in transit don't rub up against each other and crack. Well, they just throw that stuff in the garbage. It's just laying around. So I just walked up, grabbed a couple of pieces, rolled it up, threw it over my shoulder, and I thought I was going to walk out and somebody would be like, Mister, you're stealing that. Nobody said a word. Nobody said anything. So I took it home. I stretched it across the frame, stapled around it so that it stayed in place, and then it laid on top of this. Everybody know what this is? Yep. Concrete mixing tub. That's exactly right. 16 bucks at a hardware store. Okay. They have small, they sell smaller sizes, they're like half. They're like nine bucks. <clears throat> Put this underneath that. And then I would shovel, and mom helped too, would shovel the product out of the bin on top of the mesh. And then with my hands, I would rub up and down so that the castings would fall down. Now, a couple of problems with that. <clears throat> the holes, again, you don't know what you don't know. We're first starting out. The holes were too big. They were about a half inch. So, yes, the castings are coming out, but what else is coming out? The worms, right? I was losing my mind picking those little buggers out of the castings because we're trying to sell the castings. And I don't want to lose the worms because they're eating my stuff. So what do you do? Well, how do you go smaller? Who knows? So next. Okay. Do yourself a favor. Don't buy this. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm a pretty strong guy, okay? 20 bins, eight hours. My shoulders were burning, okay? 12 bucks on Amazon, no big deal. The uh, gem sluicers use it, okay? When they're in a, the creek, they're sluicer for gems, right? Literally, if you can imagine me sitting on a in a chair on our driveway over a five-gallon bucket, shovel, shake, shovel, shake for eight hours. Okay, best shoulder workout you've ever had. Don't buy it. Okay, but you can use it. Never lost a worm though, because the holes, and I don't know if it's hard to see, and you guys are welcome when we're done to come up and touch or whatever. The holes are a lot smaller. Okay, you're looking at about eighth of an inch here. So worms and cocoons are not gonna fall through here. Okay, well, what happens? Okay, God says, I hear you, your shoulders are burning. So I subscribe to, a, there's a guy in New York, he runs a worm company. It's mostly affiliate marketing, but he has a newsletter that's free. One day he sent in his newsletter, I have free plans available to anybody who wants them for a casting sifter. Materials list, diagram, catches, you got to build it yourself. Cool. You can build stuff. I read the plans. My wife and I have three kids under the age of seven. We both work. Time gets to be time. You're like, you know, hey, I don't have time to do any of this stuff. Thankfully, my baby sister, her now husband, had plenty of time, and he's a really, really good builder. So I gave him these plans, and I said, hey, can you build this? He's like, can I build it? I can build it, and I can make it better. And so what did he build? He built this. This is a casting sifter. And I'll show you. I have a video that I'm going to show you here in just a minute of it actually working. So I'll hold it up so you can kind of see it. Right? It's PVC pipe. This is, was a broom handle. Anybody know what this is? The, hey, garbage can from Bed Bath & Beyond. Out of business. That's true. He's right. I probably got their last metal waste basket. They'd probably be rolling over their grave if they knew what I'm doing now. Um, but it breaks down. You can actually take this crank off because, talk about another shoulder workout. You can take this off and you can put a drill on the end. And the drill will turn it for yourself. Okay. Steel rod right through the middle. Everything's bolted. <clears throat> this, uh, my brother in law, Dan, built this so that this tub slides right underneath. You can see it. Uh, you can't see it in the picture. It's on the back side, but it slides right underneath. Product goes in, you crank, castings fall down. So I told you all about it. Let's see if the video will play. Winner. All right. So. I turned the sound off just so you could listen to me talk instead of listening to me talk about me talking. So bin, right? This is when we were in totes. <clears throat> Holes around the top, you can see. 
Yeah, you? Oh, it's you. I was like, it's not on the video. Yeah. It's like, I didn't put music on this. Um, this is really just me talking. This is So this was back when everything was in our garage. See how messy our garage used to be. It's still this messy, I promise. The bins just aren't in there. So every bin you see used to have worms in it. Okay, and I had them numbered because I tracked how many castings I got from each tote every week, what was getting fed, all that kind of stuff. So here it is in action. <clears throat> just take a shovel if I ever get to that. I'm sure I'm rambling. I tend to ramble a lot. How are we doing on time? Okay. Oh, yeah, not bad. Good. We're coming close to the end. All right. So those worms, what do we care about? We said we cared about keeping the worms from falling down in the thing, right? So you see me, I'm shoveling in. You see it's at an angle. Okay. I don't know if it's hard to see there. At an angle. Okay. So that when you're turning, stuff's not falling out this side. Because all you want is you want it coming out the bottom. It's also configured while this plays because what's going to happen is you're going to turn this, your castings are going to fall into the tub, and you're going to be left with the big stuff that's undigested in this can. Well, eventually it's going to get full. Well, how do you empty it? Well, you don't want to pick this thing up and dump it back into the bin, right? So this is made to pop off, okay? Front pops off right here, okay? Comes right off. Dump it out. Click it right back in, and you're done. Um, the, I told Joey, I apologize. The one thing I intended to do but I forgot to do was bring copies of the plans for everybody. If you want copies of the plans, they're free. You can have them. I'll send them to Joey. They're in PDF. He'll make sure anybody that wants them can get They were free to me, so they're definitely free to you. See where I'm turning? Gassing's falling down. Now, again, holes are a little big, so you're getting pieces of undigested pieces of eggshell. Um, I pick up one at some point. Um, I use was using pine needles for bedding. Um, some pine needles will fall through. Um, I like clean, unadulterated castings. We sell 100% worm castings. That's what we, we advertise, that's what we sell. We don't cut with anything. There are very large companies that sell worm castings in big box stores. And the front of it will say 100% worm castings or 100% earthworm castings, and it's not. I don't doubt that the worm castings that are in there are 100% castings, but they cut their castings with peat and with, with ground up pulverized leaves and calcium carbonate, uh, bone meal, fish meal. Um, so you, you never know exactly what you're getting. Um, so that's, that, this is where we started. Okay. That's essentially, and again, for a home, home gardener, this is perfect. You only have one bin. You're done sifting and feeding in an hour. Now, 20 bins with this still took me almost an entire day. And I was getting 50 to 60 pounds of castings for my worms every week. Okay. That sounds like a lot, but when I show you what I have now and I tell you what I get now, you're going to have saucers for eyes. So that's what I have now. Okay. We should probably name it that. I, I guess we haven't named it. We should probably name it. It's electric. Boogie, woogie, woogie. No, nobody. Okay. Sorry. Um, my wife's smiling in the back, but. That's all right. So it's electric, plugs in. There's a switch right there. This was designed because they make these. Okay. There are very large companies that make these commercially. If you bought a commercial one, brand new, how much thing costs? Throw some out there. $2,000. Cheap, cheapest one you can find is $2,000. Okay. Again, God looking out for you, right? Dad and I were at the farmer's market in Charlotte one day. This lady walked by and she's like, hey, I want to show you something. She had one of those old Motorola flip phones, right? I didn't even know they still existed. Somehow she had a video. Oh, there you go. Well, somehow she had a video on this flip phone. She flips it. She comes around the backside. She's like, I want to show you something. It was a video of this thing in action. And I'm like, holy moly, that's the coolest thing I ever saw. She says, do you want it? And I'm like, well, do I want it? Like, are you selling it? Well, yeah, we're selling it price was very reasonable her dad built that from scratch okay so it's possible to build it i there's no way i could have built that i'm pretty handy but i could have never built this thing i went to his house he's in his 70s he's getting ready to retire he and his wife sold their house and she said she said that thing is not going to the new house you're leaving it here you're selling it or throwing it in the trash he said well let's try to sell it so 
the mother and the daughter were at the farmer's market one day. They walked past dad and I. They saw what we were doing. They came back the next week with the video. And he knew that I would, if I knew what I was talking about, what I would want to know. And so I started asking her all these questions. And halfway through, she hadn't answered any. And I was like, maybe I need to slow down so she can answer these questions. She hands me a post-it note. I actually still have the post-it note because it meant that much to me. Literally, the answers to every question that I had just asked her was written on the post-it note. He had anticipated what I was going to ask. He knew what I was going to ask, and it was right there. And so I asked her how much she wanted. And I don't mind telling you guys, 600 bucks. Now, the only thing we had, it didn't fit in my pickup truck because it's 10 feet long, and it's a million pounds. So my wife and I had to rent a U-Haul truck just to get it out of there. And it was just she and I muscling this thing up into the U-Haul because the poor man get, gets around with a cane, and he couldn't really help us. Um, but it, it is, it is a beast and I have a video to show you guys what it does now. So what you're looking at is, so yeah, it's essentially two sections. You got this one section here, another section here, and then they're welded together in the middle. And there is a belt that runs around the middle and there's a motor down here underneath. These are all casters turned upside down. For those who don't know what a caster is, it's a wheel. Okay. Wheel, you, they have them on like wash tubs and stuff. like There's probably casters on something in here. There you go. Those are all casters. So these are big casters. They're turned upside down and welded to this metal frame. He did all the welding, all the wiring. This guy was awesome. Um, and so uh, it spins. And the first section is eighth inch hardware cloth. The second section is quarter inch hardware cloth. And then it's open at the end. And it's hard to see in the picture, but it's also at a slant. So when you turn it on, it spins. <clears throat> you feed the product in from the other side. The first bin and you'll see it in the video when i play it for you guys is castings and it's eighth inch cloth so you're not even the little stuff that i was getting that falls through here that i had to pick out with my fingers it's not even falling through there that's where my pure people will come to the farmer's market just to run their fingers through our castings that's how velvety smooth and soft they are coming out of the eighth inch so then quarter inch is bigger pieces uh in in compost talk that's called overs which is just short for leftovers um, you know, everyone likes to have their own lingo. And then out the back end will be all the worms. The worms come out the back end. Cocoons usually come out the back end. And all of the stuff in the second bin, the second, because there's bins underneath here, and I'll, I'll show you in the video, everything that comes out of here and that comes out of the end goes back into the trough for the worms to, get, to continue working on. There's no waste. We waste absolutely nothing at all whatsoever. All right, so video. So there it is running. And this was, I've, I've taken multiple videos now. If you guys are on social media, I'm on Instagram. There's probably a video of me once a week if you want to get on Instagram. It's just our silent partners on, on Instagram. This video was the very, very first one I took because I wanted to, my, my sister is a traveling nurse. So they're, she and uh, my brother-in-law, they're, they're like all over the country. They're not home that often, um, but I was super excited. And my brother-in-law, who's the handy one who built this, was super excited. See, there's my castings. And so when I made this video, if I had the audio on, it's me basically yelling and screaming, Dan, you'll never believe this thing is amazing. So before we now, so there's your overs, right? So these, again, he custom made it so that the drawers drop down. These slide right underneath. You close it back up. When this gets full, <clears throat> you dump it and you start over again. So there's your overs. All the worms coming out the back end. You're not losing a single worm. You're not losing a single cocoon. And this guy built it by hand. The only thing he really spent any real money on was the trommel itself. See how the side drops down? And then you can, the trays come in and out. The only thing he really spent any money on was the actual trommel sections. He found a company, uh, he lives in, in Concord. I live in Harrisburg near Charlotte. He found a company, the company that makes the forms. So, you know, culverts that go in front of a house for drainage. They make the forms that go under your driveway to keep the water running underneath your driveway. So he spent about 700 bucks on those from that company that, that fabricates them because that's the only thing he couldn't fabricate himself. And so that's me yelling in the video, see, this is where we came from. Um, and Cause that's, uh, this was that at our farm. He even put the head of, he took the head of a broom, took it off of the broom, bolted it to the side so that it cleans itself as it runs. It was literally, it's still to this day, I use it all, once a week. It's still the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, so I told you what I got before, right? Eight hours, 20 bins, 
this and or this, we're looking at 70, 80 pounds of castings, okay? Now we're not in bins anymore, okay? You see my buckets full? I can process all of my product in two hours, and I average between two and 300 pounds of castings a week. So think about that, okay? Now, again, you know, yeah, it was 600 bucks, but if you're in business, what's a $600 write-off to save your shoulders, to get more product? Because the more you sell, the more money you have to build your business, right? So that's my trauma, and it's electric. I think that's the end of the video. All right, so we'll run through this real quick. We're coming to the end. What are the benefits? People are like, who cares, right? Well, marigolds care. That's one marigold plant, right? You guys seen marigolds at Garden Center, right? Ever see a marigold look like that? Not me. Now that's my garden at home. Strawberry plants, castings, no castings, right? Everybody always likes to see side by side, right? So, you know, I feel bad for the little guy with no castings, but I needed a, you know, side by side for people to see, hey, this is a real thing, okay? This young lady, great, her and her, she and her mom, great customers of dad and I. <clears throat> also, a marigold. Yep. She's about, this young lady is about my height. She's a little shorter. It's like 5'5". Five, five. I'm 5'8". Five, okay? The benefits are clear. Okay? Here we go. Alex. Okay? I, had, I, I couldn't put this in here without telling this story because he means a lot to Dad and I. So, when Dad and I first started, right, I told you, he told me the story in December. January comes, we get our first worms. We start having castings within the first 30 days or so. We're like, all right, we're going to sell. And I'm like, eh, I want to wait. I want to use this stuff first. I want to make sure it actually works and it's not snake oil before we start selling it to people. So we waited about four months. We didn't start selling anything to anybody until May. We went to the farmer's market. And he and I were literally like, we're not going to sell anything. If we, if we sell one thing, we'll be happy. First week, we almost sold out. Our very, very first customer was this little boy. Well, he's not actually. I don't know if he's in. He's, he's, I thought I had him in a picture. He may be in. Here he is right there. So this is my before and after. I keep these at the farmer's market. Alex is his name. So he comes up. He's walking the farmer's market with his mom. His mom's a school teacher. She's an elementary school teacher. And it was May, so it's coming to the end of the school year. He had gone to her class to help her break down their classroom for the end of the year. And she'd had this plant in a what was a gallon milk jug which she thought was dead and she was going to throw it in the trash because she's cleaning up her room for the end of the year and alex is with her and alex is like no ma don't throw it away i want to try to i want to try to revive this thing let's let's have a, a summer project so she's like fine whatever two days later they meet dad and i at the farmer's market they hear our story she's like and alex he was six at the time mom we should try this on the plant that i got from your classroom She's like, okay, so she just bought a half a pound. She doesn't need a lot. It's a little little bitty plant. Well, and we've become great friends. I talk to her once a month probably now. She lives in Moorhead City now. Once a week, she would send me pictures, okay? And this is the, you know, if you want to see this after we're done, feel free to come up and see the, the once a week thing. But it went from, in a month, this to this. Same pot, same soil, same everything. Just a half a pound of our castings added to that and brought it back to life. Again, you can't fake it. I, I wish you could, but you can't fake it. One-time application. Yep. All right, husbandry. I would, I would be remiss if I didn't add this in here for you guys, okay? Yes, with little ears in here, so I'm going to keep it G-rated. Those are two worms making baby worms okay every six weeks if worms are happy they will reproduce worms are asexual which means they have male and female sex organs you don't have to have male worms you don't have to have female worms okay and worms are super easy they rub up against each other they make cocoons see a little worm poking out that's how small they are they're in the palm of my hand when you catch them they look like one if i didn't tell you that was two worms, you probably wouldn't know. But that's how close they get. They literally entangle themselves, and the slime on the outside is an enzyme. Of the, you know, everybody's touched a worm. You know how worms are slimy. It's an enzyme. That enzyme, as they rub together and create friction, that enzyme 
creates the egg sac, the cocoon. You get six to eight worms per cocoon. As tiny as they are, two to three might survive. But every six weeks, if they're happy, you're at least doubling your population. So think about that. Buy worms one time, keep them happy. You'll never have to buy worms ever again. All right. So I don't know if you guys listen to podcasts. I never did before this whole thing. My sister, youngest sister, has been trying to get me to listen to podcasts all the time. Yes, I told you I would let you know about this guy. And only because it's not to promote me, it's to promote him. Because I feel like if you guys are here, your gardeners, your farmers, your home gardeners, you would benefit from what Mr. Greg Peterson has to say. So this is his podcast, The Urban Farm. Two seconds about Greg. Greg used to live in Arizona. Arizona is the desert, right? It's crazy hard to build or to grow anything in the desert. Greg lived in the desert for 40 plus years. He figured out, and he lived in downtown Phoenix, okay? He figured out how to create an edible landscape and a farm on a quarter acre around his house in downtown Phoenix. So much to the point where it became so popular that people were paying him to tour his property because literally everything around you was edible. Now, <clears throat> just recently, uh, I don't know, probably a year and a half ago, Greg and uh, his partner moved to Asheville. Everybody knows where Asheville is, right? We're Asheville here. So dad and I, we were at Asheville every year in Asheville. There's a huge three-day herb festival. So shameless plug for the Asheville Herb Fest. It's next weekend. Come see us. We'll be there. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's awesome. If you're plant people, come on up for a day. Okay, we're there all three days, but it's massive. It's at the Western North Carolina Agricultural Center. And I had never met Greg. So one of the first, when I'm like, all right, I got to listen to podcasts. This was the first podcast I found because he had interviewed Dr. Rhonda Sherman years and years ago about vermiculture. So I'm like, all right, well, maybe I should listen to some more episodes of this. And he's up over 700 episodes now. Well, I never knew what he looked like because you listen to a podcast. You don't get to see somebody's face. I'm in the truck. I'm listening to podcasts. I don't know what he looks like. <clears throat> but to me, he's super famous because he's my podcast guy. Well, he had been talking about, oh, my, 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 my partner and I were moving to Asheville, North Carolina. You know, I didn't know when it was, but I just remember thinking when dad and I were there, hey, it'd be really cool if Greg just popped in here because it's probably really close to his house. But I don't even know how I'm going to know him because I don't know what he looks like. Now, there's Google. I could have Googled his picture, but I'm not so great with technology. You know, Joey and I were fighting over who was going to do this because I didn't thought we were going to screw up the presentation. Um, the last day, Sunday. <clears throat> this guy walks up and he's talking to me. He's asking me about my castings because he wanted to plant an orchard and he wanted to know if dad and I would sell him bulk castings for his orchard. And his voice was familiar to me, but I wasn't putting two and two together. So he's like, all right, I'm gonna give you my business card. The next time you're up this way, bring me some castings. So I look at his business card and this logo was on his business card. And the only thing I had known was the logo because that's what pops up on my truck screen when I'm listening to the podcast. And I'm like, but it's, his name wasn't on the card. And I looked at him and he looked back and I was like, wait, are you? He goes, my who? He's super coy like that, but he's super nice. Are you Greg Peterson? He goes, maybe. And, and I was starting to get chills. Like I'm starting to get them right now because I was totally fanboying. I 100% was. And so he was like, let's take selfies and let's this and let's that. And he's like, he says to me, I'll never forget it. You have to be on the podcast. And I'm like, I didn't know what to say. I was like, uh, yes. So I was on the podcast. You want to listen? It's episode 693. Uh, it's on Apple. It's on whatever. But listen to mine, of course. It's a lot about this. It's more about my personal life and the personal side of what dad and I have started and what we're growing with our family uh, and less about this and a little bit more about my children's book, which is there. So that's the other story I want to tell you guys real quick. So we were at the farmer's market and we were talking to this lady is a super nice lady in Huntersville. She started a charity. She's the executive director of what's called Hope House Foundation. So they build um, tiny houses and they're helping to battle systemic homelessness for single mothers in that area. So instead of homelessness in a, in a, in a, let's say in a, a residential type dormitory style where everybody's kind of sleeping in bunks, you get your own tiny house, you get your own kitchen. They give you job skills, education. Well, she was asking dad and I some gardening questions. And when she was done, we, my, we've partnered with her quite a bit since then, her friend with her worked for Scholastic. 
And she says, I work for Scholastic, think book fairs, right? School book fairs. She's like, you know what you need to do? You need to write a children's book. And I'm like, that's completely random. What are you talking about? Well, you have two things kids love. You have worms and you have poop. And I'm like, well, I'll be darned. And she didn't know this, but I have a bachelor's degree in English. So if there's anything that I'm actually moderately good at, it's writing. Um, so that day between the farmer's market and my house, I wrote the whole book in my head. Now, it took me another six months to publish it because I had to get it illustrated and all those other things. But we actually just reached it's I'm really glad that I'm here with you guys today because yesterday was one year self-published on Amazon. So we self-published on Amazon over the weekend. We sold our thousandth copy. Um, paperbacks are on Amazon and my website. Hardcovers are on Barnes and Noble. Uh, and then there's a couple small bookstores around Charlotte that carry it as well. And then the paperback and hardcovers on our website. Um, but so go listen to Greg, go talk to Greg. Greg is a wealth of knowledge. His weekly newsletter is also free. He also does a weekly and sometimes biweekly YouTube thing. Sometimes it's about fruit trees. Sometimes it's about vegetable planting, um, different stuff. Greg is awesome. His podcast is also free. It's, you had to ask me, I, you know, I think it's E-N, but I'm not 100% sure. If you, um, it, it'll come up. All you have to do is Google Urban Farm Greg Peterson, and it'll come up. He's the only, he's the only one. Um, and the Urban Farm that he created in Phoenix, even though they don't live there, is still there. What? Oh, it's Owen. There you go. So Google people at the back. Owen. There you go. Uh, Greg. All right. So questions. Did it? How did I do? What time is it? Good. Oh, we're past time. Boo -hoo. Oh, seven minutes, man. All right. Um, there's my contact information. Yes, that's my cell phone number. Yes, you can have it. Yes, you can call me. It's really okay. Um, try not to do it at three in the morning. If you're awake, it's okay. My wife and I probably are awake also because our children don't sleep, <clears throat> which means we don't sleep. So yeah, you don't sleep either. You can come to our house. Our six-year-old right now is the only one who's sleeping. The three-year-old's not. Oh, there you go. The other one, the, our two girls, eh. the, the one-year-old's getting better, but the three-year-old is not sleeping. Um, that's our website. I just fixed. There was an issue. I apologize to those who have followed me before and who are on Zoom. Uh, there was an issue with the shipping on our website. I fixed it yesterday. So if you buy anything on our website, you can ship. We will ship to you from the website. Uh, that's my email. Like I said, that's my cell phone. Um, questions that I didn't answer, even though we're over time. Yes, sir. I know. So he showed me on his farm. Uh, he took all of the uh, soil, let's say. Yeah. Uh, and put it in a bag. Okay. Then he puts it in a certain quantity of water. Okay. Uh, then he some name for it. And then he sprays that on grass. Yep. So, are you familiar with that? Or? You see it right there? So what you're talking about, it, what you're talking about is probably compost tea. And so I was actually telling Joey, I, I probably should have put this in the presentation, but he, they wanted an intro and that's an extra step, but we have time. You guys aren't going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I'll run you through it real quick. It's super easy. Um, there's also, if you go social media, I have videos of me making tea on our Instagram. We don't make compost tea. We make what's called worm tea. And the only reason we call it worm tea is just because it's not compost tea. And the tea is an ode to how it's made. So what we do is we take our pure castings because compost tea is just made from finished compost. That's probably what he was just, he just had finished compost and he was, he was making this, this, it's the same thing. You're essentially, it's nutrient transference from the castings into a liquid version so that you can spray it easier to apply. So we take our castings, we fill a five, uh, five pound cotton bag it's 100 percent cotton drawstring bag with five pounds of our pure castings we steep that in a five gallon bucket of water yep and then the so there's two to that don't use chlorinated water so you need distilled well water rain barrel um if you just can't access any of that if you fill the five gallon bucket full of chlorinated water which is basically just city water if your water has a chlorine taste to it there's chlorine in it let it sit out in the sun for 24 hours. The chlorine will bubble off. Um, steep that. Here's the next step. This is usually what they don't do when they make compost tea. This is why it's a little different. Excuse me. Get yourself a $10 aquarium bubbler. Okay. 
The motor itself looks like a deck of cards. You can buy them at Walmart. Has a hose and a stone at the end and a plug on the other end. Plug it in. The hose and the stone goes into the bucket with the bag of castings. Let it steep and aerate for a minimum of 24, maximum of 72. Okay, when it's done, you will have a concentrated, which is what we sell, a concentrated tea. Now, it can be diluted or not diluted. That's the difference between that and chemical-based fertilizer. Chemical-based fertilizer, you have to dilute it or it's going to burn up your plants. Before I knew I had any idea what I was doing, I killed a bunch of apple trees because I put way too much chemical-based fertilizer in a hole. And I was like, why are they dying? I just fertilized them like crazy. That's why. Okay, This, no chemicals, so you don't have to dilute it but it's meant to be diluted. Again, if you're diluting it, no chlorinated water, rain barrel, distilled, um, uh, well water. My parents live in a house with a well, so we use uh, our farm has a well. Um, but warm tea is what we call ours only because Dr. Sherman calls it warm tea. It's essentially an extract. Uh, the only difference with the bubbler is you're activating the microbial life, which want the oxygen. Whereas you're not just transferring the, the nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus and the other uh, benefits, the other minerals that are inside the castings into the liquid, you're also waking up the bacteria to help heal the soil. Good question, though. Really, really good question. Anybody else? Go ahead. Yeah. To have an advantage of using it, would you want to figure out use that in a small plant? So it, any, any, the application is anything you would use fertilizer on. And the reason I say that is it can be house plants. I use it on our vegetable garden at home. I have very, very, very large raised beds in our backyard. We use it at our farm. We also have uh, a landscaper. We have multiple landscapers, but we have a landscaper at uh, he in Wilmington. He actually came to me. The You've seen the big 250-gallon IBC totes that landscapers use for irrigation. Farmers use them too. He wanted to buy 250 gallons of tea. And I told him, I said, you know what? I'm happy to sell you 250 gallons of tea. It's not cost effective for you, though, because we sell it for $40 a gallon. I said, but what I can do is I can sell you a bucket of castings and I can teach you to make the tea yourself in your 250 gallon tote and you can make it whenever you want it. And so then he uses that to spray it on customers lawns. I didn't add the there's a picture I have my in-laws. My wife's parents live in New Jersey near Princeton. There is a company in Princeton. My father in law was out for a walk one day and he took a picture of a tanker truck and it's the company is Woodwinds Worm Tea, and they drive around the houses in Princeton spraying people's lawns with worm tea, and it's a, it's a chemical-free alternative to, to liquid fertilizer. So it's literally any application for fertilizer, just as good, sometimes better. Other questions? You had a question. Hit me. That is such a good question. So do you know where cotton comes from? Cotton comes from plant. So cotton grows in the ground. The shirt, if you're wearing the, the cotton in your shirt, that started out as a plant. And you've probably seen it driving in the car with your parents on the side of the road. The white cotton balls, okay, they grow from a cotton plant. And then they harvest that ball and they, they refine it and they get it down to a thread and then they make clothes from it. So anything that came from the ground, decaying matter, will eventually go back into the ground and the worms will eat it. That's a really good question. Though. Super good question. Anybody else? No? All right. Well, thank you. I have castings. Uh, my children's book is at for sale at the back if you guys want a children's book. If you don't want to talk to me, you just want to run out the door because this is the worst thing you ever heard in your life. You can buy my book on Amazon. That's perfectly fine, too. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. I think, okay, good. This is ready. I didn't want you to lose your... And I'll be around for, I don't know, Probably another 15, 20 minutes if you guys have questions you didn't want to ask. Yes, so how much of that do I use for like house plants? Sure. So the standard uh, 